Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 5, Episode 11, The Darkness and the Light. This episode aired January 6th, 1997. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about last week's episode? No, it was perfect. I think we like those Cisco deep into the religious thing episodes. Yes. Uh, Well, I certainly do. And I really liked how Cisco behaved through that episode. It was like he was embracing being the emissary. Yeah, he had a little bit of that Jake obsession thing going. Yes. Oh, very much so. No, that was a good one. All right. Well, should we talk about this episode? Yes, I think we should. In the cold open, we're in a cave with some Bajoran monks. And they're all praying around a big candle, yep. which they light. And during a prayer, it suddenly shoots and kills one of the monks. Now, was your first thought here, did he say something bad about Kai Wen? <laughs> no, but that's a good point. Then we go to the station where Bashir is reminding Kira to take her meds, which include hormone herbs and sedatives. Though the herbs cancel out the sedative, so I I just didn't quite understand why she would take both of them. But she is getting kickbacks from the pharmaceuticals to prescribe both of them. Well, he is a doctor, so yeah. that makes sense. Odo arrives to tell Kira about the dead monk from earlier. He was someone from her resistance cell. Yeah. Kira asks if there are any suspects, and apparently there are many. <laughs> Odo says the violence of his past finally caught up with him. I wasn't clear here if... Kira meant that this guy was maybe like a violent gangster or something in the past and joined the resistance or whether it was he was violent during the resistance. I took it as it was a criminal background kind of thing. Yeah, me too. Like he'd been violent his whole life and that worked into the resistance. Yes. And then he'd given it all up and turned to the prophets. And then said one bad thing about Kai Wen and he gets killed. (laughs) The end. (laughs) Well, Kira heads to her room in the O'Brien quarters where she gets a message, and it's a picture of the dead monk and a distorted voice saying, that's one. Dun, dun, dun. And we cue the theme song. In security now, we're replaying this short message over and over, and it was received just as the Vedic guy was being killed. Odo figures this has something to do with Kira's resistance cell, and he suggests increasing security on the station, which Sisko agrees to. And then Kira says she'll contact her previous cohorts about the attack. And of course, it's a burner phone that none of them can trace. Of of course. Now we go to the replomat and Miles checks on Kira, who appears to be eating yogurt. She's exhausted and not sleeping well. She can't believe everything that the Vedic guy survived only to die during a religious ceremony. Yeah. She said if she wasn't pregnant, she'd be hunting down his killer. But Miles reminds her she has a baby to protect. She's clearly disappointed that she can't be (laughs) hunting this guy down. Yeah. But she seems accepting of it. You see the first hint here of Kira reverting back to that action Kira. She wants to be in charge of this. She wants to be at the forefront of doing whatever needs to be done. Well, she at least wants to be involved. And yeah. you can tell it's bugging her that she's not. Right. Especially when it comes down to the resistance. And then Odo calls saying she has an incoming message and she runs off. Now we go to Ops, and they're trying to trace the signal of the incoming call, but they can't. When Kira sees who is calling her, she really softens. It's a woman named Fala, and she asks if Kira is alone. And of course, she's not. Everybody's standing right there listening. She says someone is trying to trace the signal, and that someone is Odo. Yeah. Kira tells Odo and Sisko that this woman is no threat, and she takes the call in private. She seems really terrified. Yeah, the woman is definitely panicking. She says she's being watched and she knows that they're going to kill her. She says Kira always promised to help her. So Kira says she'll send two Starfleet officers to pick her up and bring her to the station. She's like, don't worry, everything will be fine. And that seems to sort of calm this woman. And if you watch Star Trek, you know those words mean, yeah, it's not going to be good. Unless your name is in the credits, you're in big trouble. Oh, that's a good point. (laughs) And it can't be guest star either. Well, a special guest star might last a couple of episodes. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's hardly ever good. So now we go to Worf and Jadzia in a runabout, and they're talking about Jadzia losing at Tongo, <laughs> and Worf isn't going to loan her the Latin she needs. Yeah. So she says, fine, I'll just borrow money from Quark. And then Worf quotes a rule of acquisition. 
111. Yeah, did you write down that exact one? I feel like this is one you say all the time. Treat someone who is in your debt like family. Exploit them. <laughs> Which is perfect for Ferengis. But it shocks Jadzia that Worf knows the rules of acquisition, and he <laughs> says, I'm a graduate of Starfleet Academy. I know many things. That's the best line of the episode. You would see that about Worf, him just keeping these little things in his back pocket. You wouldn't expect him necessarily to know them, but they're just there, so he can just throw them out at you when he needs to. Yeah, I just like how he he implied that they've trained him for all kinds of things at Starfleet Academy. Yeah. And that I know many things. I just thought that was a really cute line. <laughs> it is also great that he is picking on Dax for a change, that she was beaten by a champion Tongo player. Maybe, but I wouldn't encourage her to go into debt with a Ferengi. Oh, gosh, no. That's a really bad yeah. idea. Especially... That's a terrible idea. You could have a potentially compromised Starfleet officer. Well, that's true, but that's I was thinking more about just her safety as a female, let's put it that way. Oh, as the Frankie would say, yes. Mm-hmm. I also think this is a little bit of Curzon coming out here. Yeah, I think that's the implication. A little bit of that over-arrogance. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, thinking that you're a great Tongo player. Oh, that part of it, yeah. In terms of how he would be a great gambler or a great Tongo player. Great in his own mind. In his, in his own mind, yeah, exactly. This comes back to something I've talked about before. You know Curzon is probably in debt across, like, the entire quadrant. I'm picturing entire systems having a picture of Curzon with Bard on it. Do not serve this man. Remember, Curzon never took Cisco back to, to Trill because he was barred from the planet. Hmm, yeah. Well, that's what we said. I don't think that was true. <laughs> I think that was our headcanon. Yeah, Bard. Well, then they try to beam Kira's friend to the runabout and everything goes wrong and she dies a horrible death. Yes. And they even show her smoking corpse, which was pretty graphic for Star Trek. Yeah, they literally showed a smoldering pile of like bones and bits. Yeah, it was bad. It reminded me of the transporter accident at the start of Star Trek The Motion Picture. Yeah. Well, now everyone is on the runabout and Kira comes in asking for a moment with her dead friend. Yep, she's dead. She picks up the woman's earring off the floor, and Oda says she was killed by a remat detonator, which is a device programmed to scramble a transporter beam upon rematerialization. Yeah. They're typically only two cubic millimeters in size, so could have been hidden on her clothing. Love the use of metric. Well, they usually use metric, but we have caught them once or twice not being metric. The transporter is supposed to detect these devices, so whoever did this understands Starfleet security protocols. So I guess he knows the code of 1234. It seems pretty ineffective if the security protocol on the transporters can be that easily bypassed. Yeah. It's like we have these super great security systems until they need to be bypassed yeah. so that something like this can happen. I feel like it would have made more sense if it hadn't been Starfleet. Yeah. If they had maybe been on a Bajoran transport or using a transporter from the planet or from the station even. Yeah. But I struggled with the fact that they were on a Starfleet runabout and somehow that runabout didn't detect this remat. Right. Or they could have done something like, remember, we, we've run across this like in the Sword of Kalos. The Klingons had a scrambler for transporters. Yeah. Maybe they could have engaged a scrambler during the transport. And you could have had a whole piece about the, if you do that, things go badly wrong. Mm, but they're yeah. expensive or they're power hungry or they're difficult to use. And it's like somebody was a real pro who set this thing up. I would have left this to an over analysis, but I feel this is one of those times where they have a plot device where you have something that's super powerful and almost doesn't make sense. It's like you have a way now of destroying any transporter system. It's like your transporters now effectively become useless. Yeah, yeah. I feel like they overdo it and then you have to back off yeah. because now you've created an amazing piece of technology that could disable transporters for all time. I agree. I think they even could have inserted a little line here or there saying, oh, they found somebody had manipulated the transporter on the runabout, yeah. or this was a really old device that got missed in the latest upgrades or something. Uh, just some little line, right. because you're right. Now they've created this device that makes, uh, why would you ever transport again? It's clearly super easy to override or to have the security system miss it or whatever. Exactly. It just, yeah, it, it was a little bit much. Yeah. We're already into over-analysis. We are. We can't help ourselves. <laughs>
Cisco asks Kira about Fala because she had said that she wasn't in the Shakar resistance yeah. cell. And she says she wasn't officially. She was a cleaner in the Cardassian records office on Decor province. She passed info to the cell for years without anyone knowing. Mm -hmm. She was always so afraid she'd get caught, but she never stopped. Even after the occupation, Fala didn't want anyone to know what she did for fear of retaliation. And that is absolutely awful. I feel bad for her. She really was genuinely terrified by this whole thing. And ultimately, it did catch up with her in the end. The actress did such a great job here. She was on screen for a few seconds, and you really kind of feel for her. Absolutely. She is very good. And Cisco says something here about, yeah, she was justified in being worried. Right. Yeah, it's just, this is awful. This is also something of a nod back to what we know about the Cardassians to this point. Do you remember when Cisco told Garrick about he knew of one of the methods that the Bajoran resistance would use to communicate, where they would turn something upside down? Oh, right. Cisco is like, they did that for years, right under your noses, and you never noticed. And this was a similar thing of they never thought, well, the cleaning woman's not going to be the one taking records or listening to the conversations. Right. It's sort of that arrogance of the Bajorans aren't smart enough to do these things. Yeah, I think I had that point in my over-analysis of being, would they really let a Bajoran near super classified pieces yeah. of information? But I guess if they didn't view them as, I mean, we would say human, but <laughs> they, they viewed them as so much less. Yeah. Oh, they would never be smart enough to do that. I mean, if you're that stupid, I guess you deserve what happens Oh, exactly. Well, didn't Garrick say, you know, Bajorans are for the menial work, the laboring tasks? Yeah, I think he did. That was in that same episode that you were just talking about. Later, Kira's heading to the temple when she hears a familiar computerized voice saying, that's two. And the voice is coming from Quark's. Quark found a pad in a shipment of Saurian brandy that was coded for Kira. And the message on it was about Fala. And it just happened to stop playing for him. Yeah, he just accidentally triggered it without giving <laughs> it to her. Yeah, he hacked her pad. Uh -huh. So again, no security. Now we go to the security office and Odo is trying to narrow down the motive for the attacks. <laughs> Kira says dozens of attacks were planned with info from Fala, so the list will be very long. And just then someone accesses Odo's security database and we get a that's three message with a picture of another member of Shakar's cell. And proving again that they have no computer security. Could they bring in some kind of specialist? <laughs> yeah. They just get into Odo's database. I mean, didn't we talk about this once before? Shouldn't he have a closed database so that it can't be accessed from the outside? Yeah, air gap to something at the very least. Yeah, an air gap just to the computer in his office, for sure. Or it's something clever, like somebody put a subspace shunt onto Odo's computer. Oh, Lord. And discovered that his password is Odo, except it uses zeros instead of the letter O. <laughs> zero D zero <laughs> exclamation point. Yes. No one will ever guess it. No. Remember when I think it was in Dramatis Personae yeah. and his one program was called Odo One. <laughs> so I don't think he's super creative. So I think that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Well, Odo sends an emergency message to Bajoran authorities to see if they can save this latest person before it's too late. And then he tells Kira that she should go to her quarters to rest because there's nothing she can do. And Kira is trying really hard to maintain her composure. She does snap a little bit here. Yeah. But then she pulls it together and she agrees to go back to her quarters. Something I really like about Nana Visitor in this whole episode is the way she's portraying someone already under stress. Yeah. She's having difficulty sleeping. This pregnancy is very difficult. Mm -hmm. She is definitely under stress. Yeah. And then this thing is all of this is happening. Yeah. And that bit where she just kind of vents at Odo, she really makes it believable. Yeah. She snaps a little bit. She pulls it back. And Odo gives her sort of an understanding look. Yes. Because what's happening just on its own is terrible. But it's also bringing up all these memories of the terrible time during the occupation. Yeah. And now she feels like she's being punished again after having gone through that. And then on top of it, she's pregnant and it's not even her baby. Right. And she's carrying this heavy kid and it, that's clearly a burden. And she wants to protect the kid, but she wants to go and protect her friends. I mean, I think that there's a lot of stress going right. on in, in her life, physical stress as well as emotional stress. And Nana does a great job at portraying this. 
She absolutely does. Well, now we see Major Kira following a large Bajoran security dude to her quarters, and he checks the room before she enters, but he doesn't go into the bedroom <laughs> where she goes. I'm not sure he's doing a great job. <laughs> Did you notice there was a Starfleet guard at the door as well? Yep. But we'll find out in a minute why he should have looked around a little bit more. But shortly after the door closes behind her, Kira hears some thuds in the outer room and she grabs a phaser. And of course, we go to a dramatic ad break. And then after the ad break, she turns off the lights and she heads into the dark outer room where she eventually finds two friends from the Shikar episode, Pharrell and Lupiza. And they've got the security <laughs> guy pinned down to the floor. And when Kira says he's there to protect her, Lupiza says, oh, sorry, <laughs> and lets him up. And the guy's like, yeah, great. <laughs> In some ways, it's kind of funny because it's like, how do you get annoyed at two heroes over the resistance? Yeah. Especially when they're sort of like, oh, sorry, dude. Yeah, totally. And they're really just also trying to protect Kira. Yeah. Well, Kira asks how they got past the newly installed security system. Uh-huh. <laughs> And Pharrell says, oh, it was a pretty good one, too. <laughs> but but Lupiza managed to retune the transporter scrambler and beam in from a transport ship. So they beam directly here. And nobody detected it on the station either. Yeah. And again, this implies that getting by Starfleet security is really super easy. And also, why would they beam into the O'Brien quarters? Wouldn't they beam into her original quarters? OK, head cannon here. Hmm. Because the security on the station is so good, they just logged into the computer and went, where's Kira staying now? They checked the phone book and her address said G5 or whatever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> whatever the addresses are. And they just beamed in there. Exactly. I don't know. It's all a little fishy and convenient in this episode. Yeah, there's a lot of, oh, well, that's convenient, isn't it? Yeah. I'm also disappointed that Dax wouldn't have picked up some kind of transporter signal happening. This is the woman who at 3 a.m. in the morning to relax is finding minor anomalies in the station's systems. Gosh, that's a great point. Yeah, it's sort of like that thing we were saying about little alerts need to come up on Odo's screen when security is violated. Yeah. Definitely when somebody randomly materializes in crew quarters, you would <laughs> think we would get an alert. Unauthorized transport. We would certainly get that on the Enterprise. Right. Well, they say they've come for the name of the person who's after them. They said they'll take care of it. And Kira is trying to tell them to let the authorities do their job. But they're like, you won't feel that way when you know who's killing our friends. And that's a clue about yes. what's to come later. But anyway, they brought her a gift of the herbs that Julian was trying to get her to take to help her with her pregnancy. And they said that they picked fresh ones for her because they thought maybe she couldn't get them on the station. Aww. And that was really sweet. They are good friends. Yeah. She seems very happy to see them. She is definitely happy to see them. I guess because of that bond of they were together for so long and they were fighting the Cardassians, yeah. these really are her comrades in arms. I think what makes it so hard when Kira suffers is that She's so great, this actress, yeah. Nana Visitor, at playing happy. Oh. A lot of times when people are smiling, this, you can tell they're acting, yes. and it's not the same as when you see them smile in real life, but there's something about the way that she does it yeah. that you really believe it. And so she seems truly happy, and then something bad happens, and you're <laughs> like, oh my God, how awful. Yeah, the episode with the Bajoran Festival, where she was so happy in it. And you remember I said, oh, I it's, know. something's going to go wrong. Kira can't be this happy. Yeah, she was very happy. That was the episode Fascination with Luoxana. Didn't take long before she wasn't happy anymore. Right. She also had great hair and great outfits in that <laughs> episode. <laughs> you know, the important things. Well, Miles comes in here at the end of the scene and Pharrell and Lupiza immediately <laughs> point their phasers at him. But Kira stops him from shooting poor innocent Miles. She's like, oh, uh, Miles, we have house guests. Before we leave this scene... I think there's a deliberate contrast here between these two and Kira. These two are still in their resistance mode. You have to do these things yourself. You know, nobody's going to help us yeah. out here. And Kira is very much, look, you know, we have authorities who can do this now. We have people who are hunting the killer. We don't have to do it all ourselves. Well, I think they were still living their original lives yeah. and Kira had sort of moved on. I mean, she's part of the military. She's working with Starfleet. Exactly. There's other people she's learned to trust. She has other team members like Miles that she knows are on her side and Odo. So I think she has a different, at least maybe at this point, we're supposed to think that she has a different, more evolved sensibility. Whereas they're like, 
Just point us. We'll be your weapon. We'll get yeah. it. But she's going to have similar thoughts in a minute. We'll see what happens. We'll get there. Well, now Odo is reporting to Cisco on the third guy to be killed, Mobra. They found his body. He had a micro-explosive implanted behind his left ear. That's another horrible way to die. Cisco asks if he thinks it's a professional assassin, but Odo doesn't think so. He thinks it's somebody trying to make a point to Major yeah. Kira. And when he's finished making the point, he'll try to kill her too. Yep. Out in Ops, Dax, Nog, and Kira are listening to the recording over and over. The That's Three recording. Yes. And now they try to convince us that Nog's ears are more <laughs> useful than the computer. <laughs> right. Eventually, they figure out that it's Kira's voice strung together and distorted. That was actually a cool twist I didn't see coming. And then they get a warning that there's been an explosion in the habitat ring in the O'Brien quarters. While they're all talking about it, Kira sneaks away and heads to the explosion site. On her way there, she knocks out two Starfleet officers and one Bajoran security guy, the big guy who was helping her earlier. Right. I mean, they're just trying to stop her from venting the whole <laughs> corridor, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> she is on a mission. Yeah, she is a little bit too focused. Absolutely. I don't think those sedatives are working. Yeah, I'm glad she didn't have a blaster. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it doesn't matter because suddenly she has some kind of attack and she passes out before she can even open the door that she's been trying to open. But I mean, I think she was just going to open the door and that could have been catastrophic for all of those people and her. Yeah. That just seemed a little crazy. Yeah, there's a hull breach on the other side. Exactly. Isn't there a way for them to close some doors or something, seal off the section if there's an actual hull breach, not just send some dudes to stand there and let her knock them over? Right. Wouldn't the emergency protocol be you can't open the door if there's vacuum on the other side? Exactly. And maybe it wouldn't have. Maybe it, right. the door would have stopped from opening. I don't know. But it certainly looked like she was just going to open that door. It was an odd choice here because I think you could have made it more dramatic doing exactly that. If she's hitting the button and trying to get the thing yeah. to open and it's saying hull breach vacuum on the other side. No, I'm not going to do it. And she's just right. hammering on it, trying to get it to open to save her friend. And pounding on it. And then she could have had the attack. That would have made more sense. Right. I yeah. think that would have been even more dramatic of just I her agree. frustration at being helpless. Yeah. No, I agree with that. So do you think that poor Bajoran security guy, the big dude, is having the crappiest day ever? Yeah. He's had a concussion and now he got knocked over by a tiny woman. <laughs> I think he's having a terrible day. Kira needs a tiny to pregnant woman. <laughs> Kira needs to apologize to him and buy him lunch at the very least. He is having a Absolutely. ratty time and he's just doing his job. Yeah. She owes him a couple of drinks at Quark's. Yeah. In the infirmary now, we learn that Kira suffered a placental laceration and then she began to hemorrhage. That sounds very bad. Yeah, none of that sounds good. No. Julian repaired the damage and she and the baby are going to be okay. She asks about Pharrell and Lupiza, and Julian says they're dead, but Miles wasn't there when it happened, so he's okay. Odo comes in as Major Kira takes off her earring. She talks wistfully about when she joined the Resistance at the age of 13. Lupiza had stuck up for her, and she tells the story about the first attack and how Lupiza made her her earring out of the remnants of the thing that they blew up. Yeah. Then she asks how they were killed, and Odo explains that someone attached a small hunter probe to a freighter. When the ship docked at the station, the probe did a visual scan looking for its target, attaching to the window and exploding. This is why you need privacy shields on all mm -hmm. the Habitat Ring apartments. And would Pharrell and Lupiza really be this careless? If they're on the run, they think somebody is after them, are they really standing by an open window? Without a privacy filter. It seemed a little bit crazy. And I wasn't sure, but do you think, was that Hunter probe on the freighter that they arrived on. Oh. So it just followed them. Because I was also trying to figure out how did they even know that they were there? Hey. The whole thing seemed a little sketchy, but maybe it actually followed them. Okay, that's a good point. This person has been following yeah. them. So there's a very good chance, right, it arrived at the same time they did. Maybe not on yeah. exactly the same ship, but on another freighter that was about to dock at the station. So it was well planned. Except they're pretty hazy overall in the details of how all of this worked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a little bit of hand waving. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. What if the probe couldn't see into one of the apartments? Would it just hang around looking there? Yeah, I think it would just keep moving from window to window. It'd just keep going in a circle around the station. Right. Plus, when you have perverts like Ferengi, you really want to have privacy filters. Oh, my God. That is a great point. Oh, that's horrible. I hadn't even thought about that. 
Kira asks Odo if he has any leads, and he says his sources on Cardassia have given him a list of 25 suspects. He's not ready to share it. He wants to narrow the list first. Kira asks if he's afraid that she'll take the list and go charging after them. And Odo's like, "Mm, yeah, kind of. (laughs) And she says, you're probably right. (laughs) And then she's just laying there crying. It's just so awful. It's nice to know that Odo's contacts on Cardassia survived the war and everything else that was going on. Yeah, so far. Odo promises that he's going to find whoever is doing this. And she says, I know you will. He is pretty thorough. But when he leaves, Kira climbs to her feet and initiates emergency transport to the security office where she steals the list of names and then beams (laughs) herself out just before Odo comes walking in. Well, and Odo immediately sees that his chair has been turned and asks the computer to locate Major Kira. And the computer says she is no longer on the station. And Odo's like, Dang it! (laughs) She is too tricky. Well, he does like a full season one scoff. Yes, he does. He's like, oh, Kira is too good for you. She does know his password. (laughs) Zero D zero exclamation mark. Well, that's the other thing. That's ridiculous, right? How would she be able to get in there so easily? But yep, she had the goods on him. And then we see she's on a runabout pulling out phasers. So Lupus's prediction was correct. Kira does want to do this by herself. She is prepared to just go out and find this person. Well, it finally affected her enough, I guess, once it was Pharrell and Lupiza, and she had such a personal connection to them. Maybe she didn't have that same personal connection to the other two, but this felt like family to her as she told the story about being essentially a child when she met them. Yes. Now Odo is telling Cisco that Kira has gone after the suspects and she even erased the names from Odo's file so he doesn't even know where she's going. Backups, people. Backups. Yeah, that, yeah. Even printed out. Cisco tells Worf to prepare the Defiant and they'll try to follow her ion trail. But Worf is like, well, that's going to be difficult <laughs> because she masked her engine emissions with a Polaron field. And Cisco does not want to hear it. And he yeah. just is like, let's go. <laughs> just make it happen. Yeah, don't give me excuses. Give me action. Well, now Kira is recording a personal log on Stardate 50416.2. I'm still trying to figure out how we just had a Stardate of one something on Strange New Worlds, and now it's five something here. But I digress. Stardates, they make no sense to me. It's fine. Just make up some numbers. (laughs) How many episodes are we in now? And your view of Stardates is still like, meh. Well, I I have just been ignoring them, but then (laughs) this one struck me so much that it was a five and we just had a one, which... I don't think that's how much difference there is supposed to be between Strange New Worlds and this episode. But maybe I I could totally be wrong. I can't keep it straight. They're Bajoran Stardates. Oh, no. (laughs) Good one. Well, she's managed to narrow down Odo's list already, and she's tracked down someone named Siliran Prin, a Cardassian living on a planet near the DMZ. She says she eliminated three other people from the list. Do you think she actually eliminated them, or was that just a manner of speaking? (laughs) I think it was a manner of speaking, but that's a good question. Did she eliminate them by (laughs) eliminating them, or did she just realize they hadn't done it? (laughs) I'm just going through the list, killing Cardassians. Uh, She seemed mad enough. It's, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Well, she beams herself into a little structure and starts looking around, and we see a grisly hand of someone who's hiding in the shadows, but we don't see their face. Yeah. And at one point, Kira sees a Cardassian and fires, but it turns out to just be a hologram. And then because she was distracted by the hologram, she gets shot by the real person who's hiding in the room. And we see a Cardassian pick her up and drop her in a chair and give her a hypo spray of something and put up a shield around her. Yeah, we only see this guy from the back and only in shadows. Yeah, so something creepy going on. And then he starts spouting some poetic nonsense about a creature born within the comforting anonymity of darkness awakening in the harsh truth of daylight. I mean, he's really annoying. Oh, yeah, he's totally into poetic fiction. You know he's got a Tumblr account. (laughs) Yeah, and we still don't see his face while he babbles. Well, Kira calls him a killer, and the guy gets really mad, saying he didn't murder anyone. She did. You killed them all. He's still hiding his face and says he sees no regret or compassion in her eyes. But she's like, what am I supposed to regret? And then he finally shows his disfigured face and says, you did this to me, and you don't even know who I am. She doesn't feel guilty for attacks she carried out during the war. She says 15 million Bajorans died during the occupation. He says he wasn't in the military, he was a servant. He cleaned uniforms for Gull Pyrrhic. 
commander of the weapons depot at Haython. She put a plasma charge outside his bedroom window, vaporizing the East Wing and killing 12 Cardassians and injuring a whole bunch more. He also mentions how the others that he killed were involved in this attack, like Mober created the plasma bomb. That woman whose name I can't remember gave them the information on, on that location. Fala. Fala, oh my God. Kira had actually placed the charge. So he was being very specific about these people. So he had convinced himself he was justified in what he was doing. Right. But Kira points out that the Gull executed 15 Bajoran farmers because they refused to display the Cardassian banner outside their homes. She said none of them liked killing. They were fighting for their freedom. And Prin in this scene is, you see him and he's kind of processing what she's saying, but then he sort of waves it off. Yeah, she says, you were all guilty and you were all legitimate targets. Yeah. It's kind of hard to disagree with her here. This was an occupying force. The people who were working in the ancillary support are just as much a target as the military. I agree, which is why I was frustrated in the episode duet, because she seemed to let the guy off the hook. I think because he was trying to do something noble, which is why she let him off the hook. Mm, Yeah. The Cardassians were denying everything that they did. And he was trying to, to an extent, atone for his sins and force the Cardassians to confront the fact that they were murderers when they were on the yeah. planet. Well, this guy says he can't believe she feels no guilt, but she says, you, meaning the Cardassians, you didn't belong there. It wasn't your world. Yeah. So that's, that's when she says the thing about you were all guilty. I mean, this was a really good scene, really intense. Yeah, very, very He said she was an indiscriminate killer where he has been careful to protect the innocent. And he says, even though her actions have condemned her, her child will be spared. He says he'll raise the child in the light. There's still hope for it. He says something about bringing the child into the light and discarding the diseased carcass of the mother, which was a bit much for me, I have to say. Oh, yeah. Kira calls him a bitter old man just out for revenge. He's convinced that he is bringing the guilty to justice. Yeah. Yeah, and he's protecting the innocent because he didn't kill all the monks. Yeah, exactly. Or blow up the whole station. Right. Well, Kira's kind of freaking out now because she's like, the baby is human. You can't just force me to give birth because Dr. Bashir says the baby still needs three more weeks. He says, I'll take care of the child and I'll teach him the difference between darkness (laughs) and light. Oh, my God. And that was when he's about to use a laser scalpel on her and she begs for a sedative and he relents. This is very horror movie at this point. When he turns on that laser scalpel, the way they frame it, Kira is in the background and he's got this glowing scalpel. And it's a close up on it. Yeah. No, that was scary. They did a pretty good job here of giving it that sort of horror movie vibe. Oh, totally. Yeah. He says, take a good look at my face. I want it to be the last thing you see. And then he gives her a sedative and starts preparing to take the baby somehow, some horrible way. But of course, as we learned earlier in the episode, sedatives don't work on her. And when he releases the force field around her, he never had a chance because she kicks him, grabs a phaser and shoots him in the chest and kills him pretty fast. Yeah. When he goes down, you see there's pretty much a huge wound in his chest. He's dead. Oh, yeah, it's bad. And now Odo, Sisko and Bashir arrive. They beam down and they find her sitting a bit shell shocked. Bashir detects the sedative in her system, but says the baby herbs counteracted the effect. She tells them he gave her the sedative because he wanted to separate the light from the dark, but he didn't realize the light only shines in the dark, and sometimes innocence is just an excuse for the guilty. Um, And that <laughs> closing line was like, um, I'm sorry, what? W- what the hell is this? I don't, I don't know what any of them. Yeah. I listened to that thing and was like, um... <laughs> Okay. I mean, I typed it in because I was like, I'm sure if I read it back, I'll understand what she's trying to say. But no, I I didn't know what was going on there. WTF is this. <laughs> totally. And, and also, that was the end. Oh, but we do get a fantastic underside tracking shot of the Defiant sort of flying over us. That's true. That was a really good ending. Well, the Defiant was. The high school poetry, they could have skipped that bit. Yeah, agreed. Well, do you have overanalysis? I think we do have some overanalysis. All right. Well, the first thing is, we already talked about it, the remat device. It was a little bit Mm. too hand wavy, a little bit too much of a disables all transporters. We dealt with that. Yeah. The second overanalysis point is Fala. They never covered how it became known she was part of the resistance cell. If she was only known 
to the other members and she wasn't officially part of the resistance and she'd kept it secret, how could he have known it was her? Yeah, I feel like that was the piece that they missed in yeah. terms of how did he gain access to that information? Right. How did he get so close to all of these people? How did he get through Starfleet security? They had a story they were trying to tell. And I do think when you've only got 46 minutes, you got to hand wave through a few of those things. Yeah. So yeah, that, that was definitely one of the hand wavy things. I totally agree. I was wondering if... Yeah. Maybe this is headcanon. Perhaps the Bajorans kept a database of people who had actually served. Mm. Maybe they were eligible for veterans benefits or something. <laughs> oh. And had found maybe. out her role through that. But also maybe it was logical deduction. This is the only person who could have had that information. Yeah. But even then, if he was obsessed with only punishing the guilty, that would be a little bit of a... Yeah, it's a stretch. Yeah, stretch of maybe yeah. it was her. I'm guessing if they had a little more time, maybe they would have told us that he had kidnapped somebody, tortured them and got information uh. out of them. I feel like they would have had to do something like that because yeah. it's not as if a Cardassian could just walk around on Bajor without anybody noticing right. and be gathering intelligence and killing people from the resistance and nobody would notice. That doesn't even make any sense. That's a good point. And he didn't seem particularly social. I doubt he had a lot of <laughs> friends on Cardassia and on uh, Bajor. Certainly not on Bajor, no. Right. Next thing. Ultimately, Shakar was the leader. Should he not be responsible? If you set the direction and the strategic and tactical objectives of the organization, then you're the one who shares the blame. Well, definitely. I think two things. One, they apparently wanted to have Shakar in this episode and in a previous episode where it would have made sense for him to appear, but I guess they had budget cuts. That's what I read. <laughs> and so he wasn't included. So oh, maybe it got cut out of the story. That's funny. But I also think a big part of this, at least we're supposed to believe a big part of this, is this guy talking himself into, I only am killing the people who caused this. The direct uh, ones yeah. involved. Yeah. And he seemed really specific and he was being so careful that there wasn't any collateral damage so that he could turn around and tell her that he was collateral damage and she hadn't cared about him and she should feel bad about it. Yeah. That's good Kim headcanon. I like that explanation. Oh, thank you very much. Every now and then I get a good headcanon. But Shakar should have been in this episode. Yeah. Okay. So the final one. Yeah. And this is the big one I've been thinking about the whole episode. This guy, Sillerin. Did it strike you as he seemed to be really effective at obtaining Romulan technology, hacking Federation transporter security, Odo's station security, uh -huh. using remote control killing devices, and this was a guy who cleaned uniforms for a gull? Yeah. So... Baloney. Is this like Garrick, who was just a gardener and is a simple tailor? I hadn't thought about that, but maybe. I think that... That makes a lot of sense that maybe yeah. he was just pretending that he was just a servant, but in fact, he was so something more. Because, yeah, he needed some kind of help to do this. There's no way he was just a servant and was doing all these things. Right. So, yeah, something funny going on there. I am convinced he was a contemporary of Garrick. Maybe even Garrick thought this guy was dead. Maybe he was a former Obsidian Order, so would have all these skills. Maybe. And that's how he was able to do these things. He wasn't just a simple tailor or a gardener or a uniform cleaner. He was a much more capable agent or assassin. What if he had some brain damage as part of that attack? Yeah. And so he convinced himself that he was actually a servant when in fact he was not. Oh gosh, you're right. He was an agent. He was like Garrick and this was his cover. And because of the effects of the explosion and how he was injured, he believed the cover story. Wow. Maybe. Okay, that's really cool. I'm the master of headcanon in this episode. You are. Rocking it, Cam. Between this and anything that has to do with the prophets, I can come up with a story. <laughs> like it. <laughs> that wraps it up for me. Over to you. Well, I think we talked about most of the things in my overanalysis. Like, I wondered how did this guy know so much about Starfleet security? We talked about that. How did he accomplish this when he was clearly just hiding away from everybody on this yeah. little planet? Would the Cardassians really allow a cleaner access to top secret information? We talked about that. I'm still a little stuck on this thing that happened in, yeah. in Duet because I felt like she sort of caved in to saying, oh, yeah, you don't need to be held accountable. You were just the file clerk, I think Maritza was. This is a much better written version of the story. I believe this would be her attitude, especially since this is forcing her to relive that time when all of the Bajorans were being killed. 
Oh, right? yes. He's brought her back to that time. And so I think all that anger would resurface. And so she's not going to regret anything. She's going to think everybody yeah. should be held accountable. So I think this makes way more sense than that. Interesting. Well, maybe part of the Maritza storyline was Kira trying not to be that person she was. Mm, maybe. She was making a distinction. And also, going back to my point, maybe it was because Maritza realized that what the Cardassians did was wrong yeah. and was trying to force the Cardassians to atone for it. And this person didn't. Yes. And this guy didn't. Okay. Okay. I'll buy that. That's why we talk about it. And then my last uh, item here in over analysis is the ending line was baffling. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what it meant. I, uh, <laughs> I'm glad you felt that way too. I, was just like, I, I mean, it was okay when he was spouting that stuff because he was crazy. But when Kira said it, I was like, okay. Is there some kind of gas on that planet that turns you into a bad poet? Oh, maybe. Yeah. He's been injecting those sedatives. <gasps> That's it. That's what the sedatives did. <laughs> oh, good point. You start speaking in teenage poetry. I'll go with that. All right, let's move to women in the future. And for a change, I have something to say at women in the future. It's been pretty quiet lately. Yeah. I guess because Kira has not been in all the episodes. Yeah. And so it's nice to have an episode about her here. This is the kind of Kira that I really would have appreciated in season one. Not just that angry woman, yeah. but calculated and brutal. It was such an interesting juxtaposition to see her as the pregnant mother and the defender of Bajor at the same time. Right. And to me, this just made so much more sense. And it was a very good portrayal. It was very well written and it was just incredibly acted by an Inna visitor. Yes. So that's all I have to say about women of the future. Thumbs up to the women in the future here. <laughs> that's great. So let's go to rating. Speaking of thumbs, thumbs up, thumbs down or neutral. What is your rating? I am giving a thumbs up, but at the same time, I mm. think it could have been tightened up a lot more. Maybe this is entirely down to you have a limited writing time and you can't explore all the avenues. Yeah. I did thoroughly enjoy it. It's a good episode. In my opinion, it goes straight into horror movie at the end. All of it, right. I thought, worked well. I'm absolute thumbs up. I, I did enjoy this. I enjoyed how the Nar Visitor portrayed Kira here and the sort of Still the stuff with Kira that is just under the surface and can come out. And that I really enjoyed. I think in another type of show, he would have been removing her teeth or threatening <laughs> to remove her oh. teeth. Oh. <laughs> because that's what they always do when they're torturing people. Yeah. At least that's what they did, I don't know, in the maybe the early 2000s on TV shows. <laughs> well, I definitely give it a thumbs up. The portrayal of Kira was great. I thought the idea of what was happening was really good. I'm bummed that they killed her friends, people that she really felt were family to her. Yes. I think that was terrible. Yeah. In the middle of the episode, she was thinking about the baby and being careful about the baby, but there was something that brought Kira out, yeah. right? The Kira from the resistance came out. And she, when she charged to the O'Brien quarters, that's when she was done. She was done playing games and she was done being the victim. And she forgot that she was also carrying the O'Brien baby. Later on the planet, she was like, wait a minute, you, you can't take, you can't hurt the baby. So that protective part came out, but by then it was a little bit too late. Right. In modern Trek, or maybe not even just in Trek, but yeah. in modern television where things are serialized, mm -hmm. this could have been an entire season. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. And they would have spent a lot of time right, <laughs> explaining their way through the security things because they could have. They could have taken right. the time. Yeah. But in a 46-minute TV show, you have to decide what the story's about. Is it about how he gets around the security or is it about what this does to Kira? And I, I think they chose the right thing. That other stuff probably wouldn't Agreed. have been as interesting. Yeah. But I completely agree that it makes you go, okay, wait a minute. Now, how was he really able to do that? At the same time, I thought it was a fantastic episode, and I totally give it a thumbs up. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I think if you look at this character as maybe he is a Garrick, an, a member of the Order, yeah. then all of a sudden, so much of it is... It changes it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's how he was able to get past. That's how he was able to do these things. Right. No, that makes sense. This may be a bit of a stretch, but it also raises the question of... Are the ancillary 
staff? Are the support organizations for this occupation, are they really legitimate targets? Because he also talks about how the guy's family was killed and the other yeah. Cardassians, 23 of them were seriously injured, etc. Well, I mean, there's no good answer to that because they shouldn't have been on Bajor. I may have thought, yes, you should. Well, I don't know. I guess I feel like you should regret it because it's horrible. But are they legitimate targets? When they're on Bajor, I think they probably are yeah. because they're part of the occupation. If we had gone to Cardassia and just been dropping charges on random people, I maybe that's different. But I don't know. I don't ever want to be in the position where I have to make such a decision <laughs> because it's yeah. it's not humane to, to have to make a decision like that and to put yourself into that position. But war is terrible. And I agree with Kira. 15 million Bajorans were dying. They were just trying to put an end to it. It didn't matter who the targets were. It's hard to argue with her about that. Yeah. But it's all still awful. Okay, I think that wraps up Season 5, Episode 11. Come back next week for Episode 12. In the meantime, if you'd like to tell us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com or tweet us at rebingeit. We're also on Instagram and YouTube at rebingeit. You can check us out at talkthroughmedia.com. You can leave feedback there for individual episodes, and you can also listen to all of the other great Star Trek podcasts on our network. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it from me.